Welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. Um, I'm on with Dr. David Smith, and he is the inventor of the, of the Q color and the author of When Heads Come Together. But before I actually talk to him, which will be an interesting podcast, I would just like to ask you if to, to support this podcast, please support the advertisers on concussiontalk.com. The link is in the show notes. And as always, please subscribe, rate, and view wherever you get your podcasts. And I'd like to also please support my sponsor, who has been my sponsor since 2020, since before the, the pandemic. So that is Hedge Health. Hedge Health is a Vancouver-based company. And uh, Hedge Health bridges the gaps in, in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. Join organizations like the Canadian, Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Employee Law Canada. We rely on HedgeEck to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HedgeHealth.com for more. Now I will talk to Dr. Smith. So uh, Dr. Dr. Smith, Dr. Dave Smith, I'm not sure which one you'd like more, but uh, I guess, first of all, I, I interest you as the inventor of the, of the Q color and of the and of the author of When Heads Come Together, which is, I assume, the true we've mentioned before, but there's, there's more to you than that. So please just give everybody a brief little intro into what you, medicine and otherwise, what you, who you are. Okay. Um, I, I started out in the academic world as a chemist, strangely enough, um, ended up being a lifeguard and a big swimmer, as you were, yeah. um, and ended up seeing a double drowning. And all the beautiful young women, uh, moms, uh, started yeah. coming around me and wanting to thank me for this save. And yeah. I knew right then uh, I was hooked on being yeah. able to hopefully show off or, you know, help people and things of that nature. So I took a huge diversion and went into pre-med uh, at that point at University of Cincinnati, uh, completed there and did four years of medical school at University of Cincinnati and then on to Case Western Reserve up in Cleveland uh, for an internal medicine rotation. Uh, internal medicine for your viewers are sort of the detectives of the medical world. We are supposed to be a little bit more uh, fashioned at taking complex issues and trying to make sense out of them. And, and that yeah. was kind of perfect for what the I, rest I, of I my life I would be friends with internal, internists as well, so. Oh, good, good. Um, yeah. So believe it or not, I came out of my training and with about a year and a half, I'm somewhat of an entrepreneur and real estate and whatnot. I had the opportunity to buy the assets that Pfizer used to make advanced wound dressings. And I got the pilot plant and all the intellectual property. And I started going out making smart dressings and helping put sort of peanut butter into our chocolate or vice versa. And we were able to conceive of some clever ideas. And that caught the interest of a, milita a military company called Materials Modification Inc. And they had contracted with me to help prevent our soldiers from bleeding out on the battlefield. And there I was at the Army Research Lab giving this talk about all these clever things we'd come up with. And the project coordinator walked up to me afterwards and said, hey, you know, that was great. It was clever. Hey, I hate to opine, but you know we've got a hundred billion dollars and a hundred years into traumatic brain injury, and you know we haven't hardly moved the needle. Yeah. Why don't clever people figure out traumatic brain injury? And the guy in the front row of my talk raises his hand. He says, "I think if someone could figure out how a woodpecker can smack its head into a tree eighty million times and fly away unharmed, wouldn't we have this whole thing figured out?" Well, about eight months later, I did actually figure out how the woodpecker, the head ramming sheep all these highly G-force tolerant creatures, how they do it. And we were able to actually <clears throat> conceive of a mimic that does the same thing. And we have two different mechanisms that we, that we found nature was doing. And then we started going down that pathway to see if we could disprove it. Mm. And that's where the story started. Well, that's where it started. I was going to, I was going to ask you how you, uh, I guess, were you always interested in nature in nature? I were you like that ordinance, but, uh, it was the guy in front row of the, uh, what well, you may be, all those things, but also it was the guy in front row of the Army, Army Conference that you went to. And I was going to ask you also how you came to be interested in traumatic brain injury per se. But again, the Army Conference, as I mean, I assume now, I'm just probably more to it than that, but you're well, I mean, a medical background as well, but yeah. It, it's hard not to always be alert and aware as a physician about traumatic brain injury. There is a uh, the 
author of the largest traumatic brain injury study to date is a guy named Daniel Spate out of Arizona. And in a podcast, uh, he had said that because traumatic brain injury tends to afflict a younger population that tends to not die of their disease or their affliction, yeah. that the amount of cost and suffering, human suffering and cost to mankind is greater for traumatic brain injury than all cancer, all heart attacks and all strokes. Yeah. This is a big, big problem. And I sure don't need to tell you. Yeah, no, it's just an issue that, as always, they always say, underappreciated, under, well, I don't say underappreciated, I say, but underrepresented, but yeah, invisible injury, which is very important to hear. But uh, so actually, I want to guess first, well, not first, but yeah, it's actually about the, the, the woodpecker. So how did the, 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 the guy, the front of the army, just said, how does the woodpecker, how does the woodpecker do it? And you would have thought, that's a good question, but did you, was there, is, was, is he like involved in any sort of na natural, was he a natural historian or a natural, or nature, nat uh, naturalist? Or is he? Uh, or no, uh, the gentleman that made that comment was uh, a PhD for the Materials Modification Inc. company that had come, and he was a chemist, PhD in chemistry. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know what his yeah. idea was, but it's yeah. spot on. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I so always what, looked yeah, so what was the woodpecker? What is what is it about the woodpecker? If you can bring on um, start in your I know what I know what's in your book is up in the chapter reviews, but uh yeah, the uh previews I should say. But um so I know the I know it's uh, the whole thing in your book, but a synopsis of what the woodpecker, the mechanics of the woodpecker, the biomechanics of the woodpeckers. What it does, how it prevents himself from being, being or herself from being a brain injured all the time. Well, what what I call it is immersion. Uh, I immerse into things when trying to come up with anything interesting, novel, or clever. And so, as I started reading heavily into anything and everything I could find about woodpeckers, believe it or not, the first thing I found was that they were cavity nesting birds. And yeah. I never even heard of a cavity nesting bird. And it turns yeah. out they're peregrine falcons and owls and flycatchers and all these animals that are predator yeah. strafing birds. And think about it. A peregrine falcon will dive at 220 miles an hour, pulling <laughs> up at the last second, grabbing its prey. Yeah. That puts 60 Gs into their brain. You and I, as humans, we pass out at six to eight Gs. Yeah. The first thing that really threw me was, well, my goodness, what, what in the yeah. world would enable this animal to pull nearly 10 times the G-force that we humans yeah. can? And then I started Googling the woodpecker and it talked about its anatomy, its tongue anatomy. And there were 500,000 Google hits on why a woodpecker's skull anatomy looks this way. Oh. Its tongue attaches to the top of its beak and goes up over the top of its skull between its feathers and the skull outside the cranial cavity. And this tongue apparatus splits and goes back underneath both ears. And then here's the clincher attaches to the jugular veins yeah. and reattaches to itself and then goes in and out with every blow of its head. Because that, that yeah. could also explain, I saw the video on your on your website about the uh, the Woodbecker slow motion of the of, um, Woodbecker pecking the tree and uh, the head, you can see that the uh, the tongue is affected by the each peck, because you see the back of the head kind of go flush out That's there. Right. But, yeah. Sorry. So we, we had to postulate part of this because woodpeckers are endangered species. You're not yeah. allowed to buy one. You're not allowed to dissect one. I couldn't even yeah. buy a carcass of yeah. one. But luckily, there was an omohyoid apparatus in humans. And as yeah. a medical doctor, I knew these existed. But guess, guess what? No, no one knew what these muscles in our neck are there for. Yeah. So all of these decades and all of these centuries of knowing the anatomy of the neck and no one knew why these two sets of muscle called omohyoid muscles, why they're there. And it turns out on our early research that every time you yawn and you put your arms up over your head and your jaw drops, you block off your jugular veins in four different areas. So we started to realize that this diverted blood flow over to the venous capacitance vessels and they fill up in the brain space. And just like an airbag for the brain or bubble wrap, the brain all of a sudden can't move within the confines of the skull. And that's just like an airbag in your car. And I just happen to have physics background and chemical yeah. background, chemistry 
background. And I knew as soon as I realized what was happening, that the energy of an impact would go right through the brain and not be absorbed by that brain. If in fact we could cause everything to accelerate and decelerate at the same rate. Okay. So, uh, in your, cause you're, I know in the yawn is to get more, more oxygen, but there's also a, a chapter in your, in your book about how reabsorbing CO2 is breathing CO2 is what that does to you. So explain that. And, uh, I guess also you can explain cavitation where it is. Sure. So uh, believe it or not, when you yawn, there is no gas exchange. So no. there's no rise in oxygen, no lowering or rising of CO2. That's what's baffled mankind all along. It's the physical action of pandiculation, which is to raise your arms up, because the OMO part of OMO hyoid, OMO means shoulder. It okay. attaches way back yeah. on your shoulder blade and then comes all the way through your thorax and then up into your neck and attaches to a little bone underneath your jaw. And yeah. when you raise your arms up, you occlude your jugulars. And when you drop your jaw, you also occlude your jugulars for a full, total of four different places. And that was one of the big clues to me that why would nature do this over 20 million years of evolution? Yeah. Why would she? select for this over and over and over again. And it was not just one or two animals. It's every single mammal that has a spinal column. They have omohyoid muscles. And now for the first time, we know why they're there. So what we created was a collaring device that mimicked what it was to yawn. So if you fear putting this cue collar on, I would encourage you to never yawn again because it's identical physiology. Yeah. And then if you think about it, when you lie down at night, your volume of blood from your body goes up in your cranial space and believe it or not, to a greater degree than our collar emits. So once again, if you are somehow skittish about putting this collar on, because it's occluding your jugulars, quote yeah. unquote, I would encourage you to never ever lie down again because yeah. the volume of blood that goes into your brain is higher than what we're retaining. So when you stand up, the volume comes out of your cranial space and your brain's able to yeah. flash around. That's not a good thing. We corrected that. So yeah. we've had some powerful research organizations because it sounds a little kitschy or cutesy to yeah. talk about a woodpecker, et cetera. Yeah. But our research partners, when we have 25 publications, include the likes of Cincinnati Children's, the Mayo Clinic, Harvard, West Virginia University, Chicago North Shores, University of Toronto. Yeah. These are massive juggernauts of science and research. Yeah. They are all on board with all the research that we've performed so far, and we have 42 patents on the technology. Yeah, no, I was reading about there. I wasn't being rude and checking the text or emails or anything. I was just took, uh, going through your, through your chapter, your chapters of your book. And the, the one thing I want, so I guess before I get into the Q caller, what why is it called the Q caller? Who is this quick and stat? Who is Dr. Quick and stat? <laughs> And why is, why is it you got it? So as I started to learn more about jugular compression, it turns out that this was first reported in the American literature, or the world literature, back in 1880. So oh, we're wow. talking yeah. literally 140 years ago, yeah. right? And then in, yeah, in 1918, uh, there was a Dr. Quinkenstadt during World War I on the German side who would run out onto a battlefield after an explosion caused shrapnel to penetrate one yeah. of his soldiers. He would yeah. roll him onto the side and put a spinal needle like they do for a pregnant woman having an epidural. So a little spinal needle got inserted into the lower back. Okay. And then he would reach over and just touch both jugular veins. And then there'd be a rise in volume in that space causing that spinal needle fluid to rise. If it didn't rise, that meant that there was shrapnel that had penetrated into the spinal space. Oh. Oh. And that got called the Quinkenstadt maneuver. And it was the only maneuver ever used to evaluate the cranial spinal space all the way to 1972. 50 years. He wasn't he wasn't using he wasn't using it as a life saving life saving technique. He was using it to measure whether or not shrapnel Got, got, got penetrated the, the head. Yeah. To evaluate any penetration. And okay. that was in all the intensive care units all yeah. the way to 1972. Wow. So 
honored him, uh, this Dr. Quinkenstadt, because sadly he died of an ox cart tipping over on him. He died of a traumatic brain injury. Oh, really? I mean, yeah. truth is stranger yeah. than science, right? Yeah. And so I, I called it the Q caller. And then when I licensed this technology over to the company that's taking it forward now, Q30 Innovations, they acquired the Q. They weren't even, they didn't even know why I called it the Q. Yeah. You know what? I mean? Yeah. So they started calling their company Q30. And then the caller ended up keeping the name I originated with it, which is the Q caller. And you also have a chapter in your book called uh, About Hydrodynamics. I'm sorry if I jump kind of backwards a bit, but. Uh... The hydrodynamics, so you just explain that a bit about how, how hydrodynamics, right. and including the, I guess, I guess you can combine that with how, including which you already touched on, including the uh, jugular veins, how that. Right, so that. Hydro, hydrodynamics is one of the first chapters in almost any physics book. So there's yeah. nothing sophisticated or amazing about that. In fact, NASA was the first one to coin the phrase slosh. And that was because as rocket ships were going into outer space, the liquid rocket fuel would start to dissipate out of those rocket fuel containers and it starts sloshing and moving around. And then that energy of those rocket engines would then be reabsorbed and explode one rocket after another. So it turns out that nearly all catastrophic uh, um, missions that would go into outer space all were due to slosh. So I just shamelessly stole this from NASA and yeah. started calling it brain slosh in 2007 and 2008. Right. And guess what? It's stuck. Most traumatic brain injury researchers understand this movement of the yeah. brain means damage to the brain. Yeah. And so people don't just call it rattling around now. They call it slosh because yeah. it truly, truly better equates the study of the movement of fluids, which is called hydrodynamics. Okay. So, and, and uh, that's also because uh, if uh, you're saying, if you include the jugular, then you're, then there'll be more blood in your, in your head that will hopefully help uh, block and yeah. block another fluid. So it's temporal sound fluid, which you can touch on CBS. Yeah. So believe it or not, it's only four milliliters. That's the size of a small Easter egg or a large grape. Four yeah. milliliters is all that's necessary to retain in the cranial space. And all of a sudden your brain can't move around. And another visual for you that might help you understand why this is so powerful. I, I told our military that we were going to take IED levels of forces and move them through the soldiers' brains and not let them be absorbed. And of course, they thought I was smoking something, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I explained to them that they see this on a regular basis. If you've seen Newton's cradle balls, those five steel balls that are descended and, and hanging there from twine, and oh, you yeah, lift one yeah, ball yeah, up yeah, yeah. and release it, it goes crashing into the middle balls and yeah. all that energy of the impact goes through all the middle balls and yeah. out pops the other ball at the yeah. other end. So because they're steel balls and there's no liquid inside, that energy passes through. Now, if we plucked out that middle steel ball and put a soft, gushy, liquid-filled grape, yeah. all the energy of the impact would go into the grape, explode the grape, and nothing else would pass through. Oh. That's hydrodynamics. That's slosh. Yeah, that's and that is what's called an elastic collision. So that when two things slam together, we don't want any energy transfer absorbed by one of them, if that's possible. And yeah. we come as close as we can. In our first animal studies, we blocked 83% of brain injury by this mechanism. Now, you'll be hard pressed to find any data anywhere on any technology blocking one or 2%. So when helmets came out yeah. and started calling themselves anti-concussive, yeah. the United States Trade Organization and Safety Organization all down on them and made them pull their helmets off the shelf yeah. Yeah. worldwide and take that word concussion out of their marketing. Yeah. They didn't have any studies showing that they actually reduced brain injury. No. They do what they're supposed to and they're great. They stop yeah. the skull fracture they stop exactly. your eye from getting gouged out but they yeah. cannot stop that brain from moving around no no and so because i see that's an issue that i'm i'm kind of what's the worst word not for i don't know the word i'm looking for but i'm very passionate or well, passionate that's not really the right word but i'm looking for but because i was you know, i was talking in a second accident and i was going to hell on a bike and I had a helmet on and it saved my life but it also 
ended up getting a severe brain injury and I was like home for a coma for two weeks. And, uh, you know, so I know that helmets are great for what they, what they're for, but they're not, they don't prevent brain, brain injury. So that's not what they're right. for. Fantastic. Yeah, I would never tell you not to wear a helmet. I mean, yeah. at, at all. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, oh. sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I heard the thing go. Um, so, uh, can you just explain the Q collar? What's the Q collar? What does the Q collar look like? And what does it do? The cap uh, Yeah. And, and I apologize, I don't seem to have one handy with me. Uh, I'm on a vacation at the moment. Yes. Um, but the Q collar is a C-shaped structure that goes around from the back of the neck and then comes around and this lightly touches your jugular veins at 30 millimeters of mercury. Now to let you know how light and gentle this is, if you will look on the back of your hand and see a vein sticking up on the back of your hand, yeah, reach yeah. over one finger and touch one of those veins, you're now occluding that vein at 30 millimeters of mercury. And there's a column of blood starting at the top of the head, going all the way down the entire arm, all the way out to your hand to dilate that vein to 30 millimeters. But in the jugulars, that column of fluid is underneath the jugulars, pulling them closed. So yeah. we only need one tenth of the pressure that you just applied to the back of your hand, okay. and we will fill your cranial volume by four millimeters. That's nice. Just, that That's large. Just, Great. The grape size, yeah. It's not, it's a little more pressure than that because our engineers wanted this all to be self-contained. So yes. this is very clever. I'd love to take credit for all of this, but I can't. Yeah. Uh, others helped us along the way. We had 70 different iterations. It took us 15 years to get through the FDA. So this is highly, highly you know, engineered, and yet it looks so simple. But it literally finds its place on your neck and then occludes that tiny amount of pressure continuously, even if you turn your head right or left. If someone were to grab the collar and yank at you to tackle you, it'll come right off. So yeah. there's all these really cool little features that have enabled, uh, believe it or not, 40 NFL players in our very first season uh, are using the Q collar. There are eight in the playoffs for the Super Bowl. And actually, Boston Scott was in the Super Bowl wearing the Q collar. And that's just our first season here in the United States. We have about 9,000 college and high school players. And then we just partnered with the Army because we were able to demonstrate with 30 SWAT officers doing breacher studies with IED explosives that the pressure, the energy went right through their brains rather than damaging to the same degree. And now, I don't know if you know this at all, but what, what is the, 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 the G for? So not of a standard, not that there's a standard IED, but you know, like a IED, what would you, what are the, do you know what the G forces are for that? Well, I can tell you that uh, in our initial uh, animal study called a Marmorale protocol, that that was 900 G model, right? So you and I tend to get injured in the 100 G level with yeah. a typical impacts, maybe 150 uh, rarely, but most uh, head impacts or most injuries are usually in the 100 G form to cause significant damage. So it's way over 900 Gs and it's probably closer to 25 or 2600 Gs when an IED explosion goes off. Oh, okay. It's just so when, when did, when did say, when did the military and the NFL or the high school collegiate athletes start, start, when did you put out to them, when did the FDA say, okay, this is fair enough, you can use it now? So we submitted uh, one study after another to the FDA. And in uh, February of 2021, the FDA without notifying our company or anything, decided to go ahead and authorize us to make all these claims. Their big complaint was we were able to do what's called a tensor MRI at the beginning of the season. And then they would hit a, a thousand impacts per kid throughout the season. And we do another tensor MRI at the end of the season. And then we would digitally superimpose them. It was 10 gigabytes of information. And mm -hmm. if there was any changes at all from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, we told the FDA that the medical world considers that damage, but the FDA wasn't letting us use the word damage. Yeah. Okay. And it took us, to, I don't know, five or six more studies, a systematic review article done by the highest authorities in all the medical world saying that these are in fact damage areas. And so when the FDA did a press release, we got 350 million media hits in 48 hours. 
Mm -hmm. right? Just the FDA coming out and saying, we finally found a device that we feel is allowed to make the claim that we actually prevent brain injury. So that was in February of 2021. It's a medical device. So the FDA had to look at every marketing statement and it took almost eight months for them to clear. Government can be a little slow on these things. And so we ended up launching in the beginning of 2022 and as I said, we, we've had this unbelievable outpouring. We've been actually endorsed by the premier lacrosse league. We've okay. been endorsed by the uh, international uh, downhill bobsled and skeleton organization. That's the international form of that. Um, and again, we just partnered with the military as well. Um, and my understanding is, is we're even part of the new budget uh, at the government level, the omnibus bill. So they are planning on moving forward with purchasing cue collars. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So in, you, you wrote this book, When Heads, when heads Come, I always want to say Heads Clap, but it's When Heads Come Together. So when heads yeah. come together, so you put the re oh you got you have that one. What does it discovering nature yeah. secrets to renting traumatic brain traumatic yeah. injury? Uh, it's they're claiming they're saying traumatic brain injury. So it's a it's a, it's a knock, it's a physical hit to the head or body or whatever, but not like hypoxia or or some more like a stroke or something you can't prevent. That it does not claim that, but traumatic well traumatic the stroke is. You know, I assume you're not. I mean, uh, stroke is not, is it is directly traumatic because it causes trauma to the brain because of the blood, but you're talking so about as it turns out, act, act two is on its way. We, we have a second spinoff company that actually started to capitalize on the first thing that we identified about woodpeckers, the fact that they live yeah. in a cavity. Well, what's so interesting about a cavity? Well, in a cavity, there's no uh, movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide easily yeah. in and out of that cavity. So oxygen level is no longer 21%. It's way down at 16. What's that mama bird thinking, right? Yeah. And then you start to find out the CO2 can't get away. So the CO2 is not 0.04%. It's up to six, four to 6% CO2. That's 150 yeah. times the normal CO2. And it immediately hit me. Oh my gosh, that's raising the intracranial volume and pressure from an arterial side. So we ended up patenting not only the, the venous side, which is jugular compression, because yeah. of the nature is showing that, but we then turned around and we patented the arterial side, which is the raising of your own CO2 levels. And we have a very, very tiny, very comfortable little device that allows you to rebreathe your own exhaled gases in a very exacting way, the way nature's done it for 20 million years. And with it, we're blocking sleep apnea. We're reversing brain injury. I mean, reversing it. It's like our tagline is CPR for the brain. You know, if you have a brain injury and then we get this device to you immediately, time is of the essence. Yeah. We won't allow that chemical cascade to take off that's so damaging to all of our neurons. So that study is actually being originated at the University of Cincinnati as we speak. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's not impressive. That's exciting, exciting news. And uh, also, uh, before I guess I let you go, one of the, couldn't that be remiss not to ask you about your lifeguarding swimming, but what more it was the water polo background. So when was the last time when was the last time you played water polo? Or you you say you would say you were water polo because you were assuming you were swimming into, swimming in Orlando when the Yeah. Also uh, well I certainly I can still swir swim around in my pools and things of that nature. Yeah. But as you can remember water polo is so grueling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I was a scrawny little me you know, too PJ thing like most swimmers were back then. And you just can't keep the weight off after you stop swimming. But yeah, uh, yeah I was an All-American swimmer. We, uh, we started at Sycamore High School in Cincinnati. We were the first team that Sycamore High School ever actually put out there as a swim team and a water polo team. We had five All-Americans out of our seven people on our water polo team. Oh, yeah. And we won state against a team okay, that had a swimmers. So nice. we, in our very first year, we we won state in water polo, and it's my favorite sport of all sports. Yeah, it's it's, it's so much so much fun, and there's so much. I mean, it's it's like you said, it's grueling, and it's brutal, but uh, it's just a lot of fun to play. And, but of course, I haven't played it since my since my own brain injury because I dumped the balance. I did have the double vision, which really advanced the 
the catching the ball and all that, but like it's so much been uh, so much so much fun to play that sport. It's just yeah. Well, I'm really proud of you of where you've been able to come from. I think you've got a lot more coming, which is exciting. We we also have another patent that we're chasing called modulating the glymphatic system. Now you've heard of lymphatics all yeah. over your body, lymph node in your neck oh, or under oh, your yes. arm yeah. infection. But there are no lymphatics above the jaw. And so no one could figure out how does the brain take out the trash? Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, yeah a, a, a Macon Niedergaard out of Sweden is now over here in the U.S. studying as well, was the one who coined it, the glymphatic system. And they've identified that even when you lie down at night, there's a tiny movement of your spinal fluid away from the brain. And maybe that was what's taking the metabolites and the trash out. Yeah. And it turns out our technologies don't move it one or two millimeters. It moves at 100 to 120 millimeters and ours do it in a half a second. Yeah. So we're trying to get into the, uh, the, the different facets, the groups that are studying the lymphatic system. We've patented our technology in that realm and arena. And we're actually believing that we might be able to help facilitate in a sort of a dishwashing manner, yeah. moving these metabolites around, which should enable the brain to heal itself better. Oh, good, great. Well, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's impressive. And uh, I, really, I wish you all the best with your patents and your, and this, your uh, this military and the NFL and this, and the collegiate high school players and the bobsled and the UWC at Bobsled, getting that skiing, uh, Bobsled, lacrosse. So, uh, yeah, so all the best with all that stuff and uh, really look forward to it. So, so I uh, guess, yeah, so um, thank you so much for coming, coming on this podcast. Is there anything else you wanted to add before you, before you're off? Before I let you well, one, one last thing, just to shamelessly tout, um, I have a website and it's davidsmithmd.com. And when there, you will be able to learn anything and everything you ever wanted to learn about this process. But I also want to encourage to your listeners, if you do want to buy a Q collar, uh, you can use our promo code, uh, that is the inventor's promo code they gave me, which is just QCaller10, and they'll give you 10% off of that as well. Awesome. So just a little perk for anybody that's, that's within listening earshot. Uh, would love for everybody to be able to trial this. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. And uh, Thank this, you. Yeah, we'll, I'll tell you after. I mean, this will be confusing for people who are watching this live. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Um, and visit, so you want to say the website again before I go? Your website? Uh, the website is davidsmithmd.com. davidsmithmd.com. That's right. That's right. I have all the notes from the uh, the previews, the chapter previews. So I've been on there. So it's a great site. So uh, you can check it out. And uh, otherwise, thank you all for everyone else for listening. And uh, we'll thank see you, you again. And hopefully, listening next week. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.